Back in 2019, teenager Eddie Quarters went viral for a letter that he wrote to his teacher explaining why he didn't do his homework. And in that letter, he says, I don't want to do schoolwork over the weekend because it's a stress-free time to go out with friends, watch TV, play games. I don't do it also because it makes me very mad and unhappy. I do what makes me happy because I want to be happy. Homework is not a real thing in the real world, so we should not have to do it in school because it's not useful. So Lynn, in your experience, what sort of inventive excuses or what sort of things are we going to encounter with our students about why they can't practice their craft? Well, there's pretty much any excuse, isn't there? It'll be something like, I didn't have time. I used to also hear things like, oh, I lost the recording of the lesson, so I couldn't practice what we did. And another one which actually... I didn't hear until I got to London was that I'm I can't practice where I live because my neighbors bang on the wall and tell me to shut up. Uh, so that was something new for me when I moved to London and I realized oh actually yes people do live a lot closer and actually it's a real thing but at the first when I first heard it I thought that's just an excuse but now I realize it's very valid and sitting here in New York listening to someone practicing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star over and over next door on the piano, I get what people are saying. Yeah, so they're, they're the sort of typical excuses I would hear. I'm sure I've heard some inventive ones. I can't remember them any anymore. But um, most of the time, though, I'm also working with the more professional end uh, of the spectrum. So they will go and do the work because they're trying to achieve a particular goal. Um I think if I was working with kids and teenagers, maybe I'd be hearing some more inventive ones. What about you? Just little things like you're explaining there. No, my dog ate my larynx, unfortunately, because I would have enjoyed that one quite a lot. But the usual, no time, forgot, had a, had a virus that lasted 24 hours and their voice disappeared so they couldn't possibly do anything. Yeah, you know, the usual stuff we have to contend with in this job. But we do need to practice and singing is a motor skill. So what really is the purpose of practice? So the purpose of practice is to, first of all, as you said, make sure that the motor skills get ingrained and that happens through repetition. So we're starting to create neural pathways and then as we repeat, the neural pathways then get what's called a myelin sheath laid on top of it and then that just strengthens the neural pathway so things become more automatic or you become um, more adept. Then the other thing is probably cognitively we're also getting used to that process of what happens and which words we're going to use when and what notes we're going to sing when and how long the duration of those notes are. So practice is really just a way of reinforcing the thing that we want to do. There's quite a nice quote from Quality of Practice, a musician's guide by Susan Williams on this section of the topic. And she says, research on motor learning has discovered that the kinds of complex motor movements needed for making music are best learned unconsciously or implicitly. The mind can help this process by focusing on the intention. How do I want this to sound? What do I want to express? The centers of the brain concerned with motor control, which are not consciously controlled, will search for the solution. So what is practice not? Well, one of the things that I say to people is that you're not practicing if you're just singing the song over and over and over again. And if you're not doing it in a deliberate way. So Anders Ericsson quite famously talked about how people become experts and did a lot of research on it. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2021. Uh, and he coined the term, as far as I know, or him and his research group coined the term deliberate practice uh, as being a way that someone becomes an expert. So he was theorising that talent wasn't something you're born with. It was something that you actually developed. 
and you developed it through practice. So the sort of things that they identified in their studies as uh, helping someone get to that expert level was that they set goals. So they had goals for their practice uh, that they wanted to achieve either in the practice or as a result of doing practice over a period of time, that things got broken up into smaller chunks. So you, this is why I was saying just singing the song over and over again isn't really enough. If you're having trouble spots, whether that's musically or technically from the voice point of view, you have to just work on those sections and then you add a little bit before and a little bit after until eventually you build up to doing the whole piece. Um, and it's the same whether you're singing or playing an instrument. Um, the other thing about deliberate practice is that you need to have some sort of focus that it's a little bit beyond your ability. So if you're singing a song that you can do really easily, it's not going to develop your skills or your whether that's motor or cognitive. Another element is having some kind of feedback. So recording yourself and then listening back and making an assessment as to whether or not you achieved whatever your goals are. So in your goals, you might set out, you know, I want to be able to sing through um, to D5, uh, say, for instance, as a female singer, um, to a particular note without my voice cracking, without my larynx going up too high, and with the vowel staying whatever the vowel needs to be um, and feeling easy and and the vocal folds staying connected all the way through. And so that could be your little checklist that you have for your goal. And then when you do the feedback, it's like, did I achieve those things? And then a lot of people end up stopping at that point and they go, I didn't achieve it, so I must be really bad, you know, and they become judgmental. And this is where I say to people, actually, it's much better to go, well, what do I need to do in order to correct that? What strategy, what exercise, what thought pattern, you know, it might be the way that you're thinking about it as you approach it that's causing problems that might end up with tension and therefore your voice cracks or whatever. So don't just stop at it didn't work. Then ask yourself, what do I need to do to make it work? And then you make your adjustments. And it might be I need to go back and do a whole bunch of exercises around that area, or it might be just simply I need to add a consonant in front of that sound and then I'll be able to achieve that pitch. Or it might be I need to think or remind myself to keep my larynx in that more neutral position as I go higher. Whatever it is, because you will have worked through that with your teacher, and then um, you just work, that's your next goal, is just to work through that area, focusing on these new objectives. Repetition is another very important aspect of practice and developing um, your skills. If you just do it once, it's just not, it's not enough time for the brain and the nervous system to develop this as a habit. So repetition is really important. And quite often I'll remind people, you know, when you started walking, did you just one day decide, oh, I'm going to start walking? And most people recognize, oh, no, I started crawling or I wriggled around on the floor for a while and then I started crawling and then I started pulling myself up and I fell over quite a lot and then I would stand and then eventually one day I managed a couple of steps and then I fell and then, you know, anybody who's watched a, a child develop as they go through um, learning how to walk will realize that it's repetition, it's making mistakes, it's correcting themselves. And all this is all of this is an important part of development, both um, neurologically um, and the musculoskeletal system and your balance and cognitively. So the other thing is, of course, to um, make sure that you're not practicing for too long. So some people think I have to practice for hours and hours, but actually practicing for hours and hours, and especially if you're not doing it well, can actually create poor habits um, that you then need to undo. So making sure that you're focused, short practice sessions. Our students, because they don't really want to do hours and hours of practice, and so you can say 
10, 15 minutes, just focusing on this and then move away and go do something else and then come back, focus again on whatever your goal is and, you know, take little breaks in between. You might even make it five minutes or three minutes, depending on the difficulty. And then getting um, some sort of feedback externally as well. So I often get my students to record their practice and then they can send it to me or bring it to me at the next lesson and I can give them feedback um, with regard to, you know, what I think is going on or what might help the next time. So having a specific strategy is what practice is and not having any kind of strategy is not practice. It's just running the song. We also need to remind ourselves of why we're doing this. So regardless of what that might be, why we're coming to lessons, there's a bugbear somewhere in there. So as you say, maybe it's that D5, maybe it's the belt, maybe you're working on a functional chest voice and reminding ourselves of why we want to do that. How does it make us feel when we are singing a particular song and it's just not working the way we want it to or sounding the way we want it to and that why can really be our motivation to keep going and remind ourselves of why this practice is scheduled in in this way what do you feel about motivation motivation is really interesting um daniel pink wrote a book called drive where he realized as he was researching it that people are not motivated by what we think they're going to be motivated by. Uh, one of the important things is having autonomy, you know, feeling like you are part of making that choice. And I think that's an important thing that singing teachers can do with their students is when they set up the goals is to go, why are you doing this? What is going to be the end result? How will you feel emotionally when you achieve that? Um, and, and look at it as a what are the internal uh, motivations for doing this. It might be, you know, it makes you feel proud or it makes you feel like you've overcome a challenge. You know, I was talking to a client the other day and he's motivated very much by being able to conquer a challenge. That was the way he termed it. Um, and so when you're working with your student around sort of figuring out what their goals are and what their motivations are, really ask them those kind of questions. And are they the sort of person that goes towards something or away from something? So that's an important part of motivation as well. So am I motivated to move away because my voice cracks and I don't like that sound? Or am I motivated to move towards gaining control over my vocal folds or larynx or whatever it is? So when we understand that, that can really help us set up the motivations um, for the student. There's a couple of other things that might influence the student's approach, and that is uh, whether they um, have an intrinsic locus of control or ex extrinsic locus of control. Intrinsic is when you're thinking, I'm in control, what I do makes a difference. I'm the one that makes the decision about these things. Whereas extrinsic locus of control, those sort of people are more likely to think, oh, I'm beholden to, you know, the this is my limitation or other people or the world, you know, what's happening globally. And that's not very helpful when it comes to development. If we can shift someone's thinking to being more intrinsic locus of control or growth mindsets, another term that people often use here, then the student is more likely to go and do that practice and to feel like it's beneficial and to be motivated by going and doing that work. The reality is, and I think many of us who are in this profession understand this very clearly, um, talent alone is not enough to help you to succeed. You need to be able to, whether you believe that's developed or something you're born with, that's a whole other discussion. Um, but it, it needs, it requires work, it requires time, it, patience, it requires getting over the challenges and figuring out and moving forward. And, and so being able to help someone learn how to practice well, I think also helps, especially if you're working with young students, helps them for learning life skills. You know, I think this is something that we we can really help our students with, um, not just with their singing, but just with life. 
And also recognizing that managing that, the frustration, managing the time, dealing with everything that comes up whilst you're learning this skill is part of managing practice. Like practice isn't always hunky-dory. There are parts which are really bloody frustrating at times, but that's part and parcel of it and can actually be used in our favour. So the other thing about motivation is finding out whether the student is more motivated by negative or positive stimuli or motivations. So it might be that they can say to themselves, well, if I achieve this you know, practice session, then I don't have to do the dishes tonight. I can wait till tomorrow. Or it might be, actually, if I can achieve this, then I get a, a nice little treat or you know, I can spend a little bit more time watching Netflix. So thinking about someone's process in terms of motivation as a whether it's a negative or positive um, stimuli, then that might also help the student identify what's going to help them stay motivated. How important is variety in our practice, especially when we've got like an intention, a focus that we have? How much should we surround that with different activities? Well, when it comes to learning, there's um, quite a lot of work around the concept of interleaving as being a very valid way to learn and develop. And what that means is instead of taking something sequentially, so we start at step one and then go to two, three, four, we actually might do step one and then go to three, then five and back to two and then four. You know, So we can do that in our practice as well. And there's many things that we can be practicing. It's not just vocal technique, but there's musicality, there's learning lyrics, there's performance strategies, you know, there, it's the vocal style, you know, it's endless really what we could be practicing. And I think variation, as they say, you know, spice of life. Um, and I think it's a great way of maintaining motivation and helping someone to develop, make sure that they're not developing poor habits as well, because if you're only spending a short time on something, then moving on, maybe by the time you come back, you will have actually corrected yourself. So I see it as being very beneficial. We've spoken about having external feedback, listening back to ourselves, having a checklist that we can tick if we have achieved those things. What about having something like a logbook where we can write out these things, have a bit of reflection, and then spurring on the next practice session how would that look for us hmm. well if you think about the various learning styles which are visual auditory kinesthetic actually and reading and writing is another style i mean there's a bunch of others as well but those basic ones and that would really serve someone who's probably writing and and reading as well as maybe visual but it might not help someone who's more auditory or maybe kinesthetic because of the act of writing. So I think it would depend on the individual. Having said that, there's no reason why you can't actually maintain a, an, a, a recorded log, like portfolio of your progression that you can review. So it's definitely something we use on the level five course, you know, as a way of helping people with their learning. Um, in part, because it helps solidify whatever they're learning that week, but also because it gives us an ability to go back and reflect on progression and just to see how you have have progressed um, over a period of time. And I think that can happen in singing lessons, you know, where you have to remind the student how far they've actually progressed over the period of time that you've been with them. Because every time you conquer one you know, issue, there's always a myriad of others coming up. And I remember very specifically one of my clients telling me after a year that she didn't feel like she'd progressed and I thought she'd progressed hugely. And when we then went back to listen to what she was doing in the beginning, she realised how far she'd progressed. And I think what had happened for her was that she had dealt with all those things that together we'd help fix the things that she'd originally come in with and now she was noticing other things or she'd got to the next stage and now she wanted to develop the next bit and it, in her mind it just felt like she was still having problems but in actual fact there were new problems that couldn't have happened or been dealt with 
if she hadn't dealt with the first lot. So how long and how often should we really be doing this? I know that we've just spoken about, you know, not doing it for too long and repetition is key, but in an ideal world, what does that look like? Unfortunately, I'm not going to give you an ideal world answer. Oh, thank goodness (laughs) sake. (laughs) How long is a piece of string is the appropriate saying here. It's very individual. So I remember I had a Um, a student who his voice wouldn't really start functioning unless he'd been warming up for 30 minutes. So part of his practice strategy had to uh, include 30 minutes of vocal warm-up before he could do any technical work. Whereas other students, you know, they just do a few sirens or lip trills or a bit of straw work and off they go and they can get straight into it. So that's the first thing is to figure out What does that voice need um, in order to prepare it for practice? And then, of course, we also have to take into account, um, you know, neurodiversity. Some people just don't have the ability to focus on practice for very long. And so we need to help them strategize so that it accommodates however, you know, their neurology is. Yeah, so unfortunately, there's no absolute answer. What I can say is that long hours and hours of vocal practice is not advisable. It can contribute to vocal health issues. Um, And also, if you're performing and singing, you've got to think about how's that vocal workload during the week. You know, if you're practicing long hours and going out and performing and gigging, and maybe have a job where you use your voice, well, that's an excessive amount of vocal workload. So practice needs to be probably more on the shorter frequent side. So that could be 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, And then you could also break it up into some technical work, some more repertoire work, some performance work. And so practice can last longer if you're breaking it up into different sections. But certainly when it comes to just your voice, then it's not recommended that we spend hours working on the technical thing. And I think it's important to help our students tune into what their voice is um, working, how it works and what it responds to and what how much is too much. And, uh, you know, that might depend also on things like, you know, their vocal health and their physical health and their any general fatigue if they haven't been sleeping well. You know, all of those things need to be incorporated into understanding what our voice can do. So if I have a week ahead of me, we've spoken about how that quality practice is going to be implemented, but if I just do it once, that's probably not going to touch the sides of making change particularly quickly. So Out of seven days, how often should I be repeating the exercises in order for there to be an opportunity of change? I don't have any scientific backing for this, but I usually say at between four and five to six times a week, depending on the student, depending on their voice, depending on the time that they have available. And I always say if you can do four to five Um, sessions of five to ten minutes your voice will progress I mean certainly from a anecdotal point of view I can tell when somebody has been doing regular practice if it's more especially if it's more than four times yeah I would say four to five to six times a week I can feel the difference when I'm working with their voice the next week it's a lot easier I'm able to progress it further um, everything feels balanced. Um, you know, it just, it's more pliable. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to really explain it because it's not something I've ever had to um, verbalize before, but I definitely notice the difference. There's less resistance. Yeah, it feels like there's less resistance. Uh, but I'm I'm sure that there are some studies out there. I just don't know them. And at the end of the day, I think once again, the student needs to figure out what works for them. But I agree, just one or two practices mm, from a physiological point of view may not be hugely beneficial. Having said that, of course, we can incorporate mental practice 
So if someone's not able to practice physically, then mental practice is just as beneficial. Yes, and Susan Williams talks about that in her guide, and she says how studies have shown that a combination of mental and physical training brings the best results. Good mental training means using the conscious mind in a way that supports rather than hinders the development of complex motor skills. And we're looking at the development of metacognitive skills, so that's knowledge, regulation and control of strategies, prevents the overuse of muscles. So as you say, if we've got a very um, overloaded day vocally, then we can do that silent practice and it improves our inner hearing as well. So what would mental practice actually look like? Can we just think about it whilst we're making a spag bowl? <laughs> no, and, and in general, I, I always say about practice, um, you can't be doing another thing at the same time. So doing the dishes. I mean, I know that some people do stuff in the car because obviously they're not disturbing anyone. But the problem is you're not able to focus on the minutiae of what needs to be corrected um, when your brain is focusing on other things. And our brain, as, in spite of the fact that, you know, it's believe, people believe that, say, women can multitask, the fact is it's already proven. All that happens is our brain switches from one activity to another. So when we're practicing, that's what we should be focusing on. So mental practice is the same. You sit down or stand up or whatever it is that you're going to do and you go through that process um, as if you were doing it in your mind. So to a certain extent, the singer will have had to have had the experience before. Having said that, we're very good at mimicking and sometimes I'll say, listen to someone that we know is doing it correctly and imagine that you're that person and go through the feelings and the positions and um, the thought patterns that you believe might be needed in order to sound in that same way. But certainly if the singer has already had that experience of singing physically, um, a song or a passage or a particular exercise, uh, they then just literally go step by step of my larynx is sitting here, my vocal folds doing that, and my the rest of my body is in this position, and then they go through the exercise. Now, they might do it just mentally in terms of practicing it mentally, or they might listen to themselves doing it as they practice mentally. What is your advice to the singer who is potentially in full-time work, full-time education, maybe they have lots of extra curricular work outside of school and it's taking up all of their time. What would you say to those singers about fitting in practice? Because we're also considering the fact that we learn best when we're happy and safe. And we also might have pockets of time in the day where we feel at our most focused, but they're taken up with other things. So how on earth can we fit good quality practice in to those timetables? Well, it's hard. Uh, it might mean you have to get up a little earlier or go to bed a little later, <laughs> which I don't often recommend. Um, but, you know, you, you'll you have to sit down and figure out where realistically can I fit this in. It, it might mean that instead of, you know, an hour for lunch, you take half an hour for lunch. Or, you know, if you have a half hour lunch, maybe it ends up being like 20 minutes lunch and 10 minutes of some sort of practice. Um, and also there's always a time when we're sitting doing something, you know, like if you're taking public transport somewhere, you can do mental practice while you're doing that. Um, it might be that you have to do some negotiating <laughs> with your family to help you to do certain things that free you up, you know, so that you do have time. And there's always somewhere that you can shift there's always something you can change um or eliminate you know can you eliminate half an hour of netflix uh you know or could you you know on every second or third night have your spouse reading the bedtime story so that you can go and practice um is it possible that maybe the kids could do the washing up and clearing away uh, so that you can go off and practice. So 
there's always places where we can negotiate more time and it might just take a little bit of uh, cajoling and maybe <laughs> a little bit of bribing to get other people to help you. But if you want to progress, uh, the only way you're going to do it is to do this work and so you'll have to figure out a way. Have you got any other suggestions? Probably I would say the same sorts of things and working with higher education students and, and I, I when I set practice, I look at their schedules with them, see what when they're going to be in classes, when they are going to be at home and, you know, helping to point out, actually, there's a little pocket of time there. How about you set an alarm? And and you you that's a side for you now that that's booked up. So you can't put anything else in just like you wouldn't miss a ballet class. You're not missing your singing practice. So yeah, just maybe being a little bit more involved in when they schedule their practice and also following up with them midweek just so it keeps them accountable. Like, how are you getting on with the exercise? And sometimes you won't get a reply. Sometimes you will and they say everything's going fine or it will just give them a little prompt to, ah, yes, must do that before, you know, next session or whatever. Um, and at the beginning of our chat, actually, we mentioned the neighbours and admittedly, I am one of those grumpy neighbours who, when my neighbours' uh, children are drumming at nine o'clock at night while I'm trying to watch the Beckham documentary and <laughs> enjoy this wonderful human being in all his glory, the beat of the drum is not working for me. <laughs> so I have been known to have a little tap on the wall. Now, that's bad, really, of me, because I should appreciate fellow musicians need to do their practice but at nine o'clock at night when grandma's in her slippers I don't enjoy it so how can we work around neighbors or housemates who might not understand the musician's process or parents who don't want to hear belting late at night like basically how can I be a better neighbor <laughs> I think it's about agreement yeah, so this is from coaching, the coaching world. So it's go to your neighbours and say, I need to do this. When is the best time for you? And what days, you know, what times? So that could be one option. Um, when it comes to singing loudly, there's actually, I can't remember the name of it, uh, but there's a special cup that you can actually make big belty sounds into uh, and it muffles the sound but you can still go through the action of the singing so it might be looking for some sort of tool like that um, I know that um, the voice straw that Mindy Pack has um, also has cups as well I don't have that with me but you put this it's like a, a rubber um, collapsible cup that you put at the end of the straw and then you can um, put the cup on your mouth and you can actually sing the lyrics uh, or talk into the cup and that will muffle it as well. But yes, this there was I think it might have been called the belt mask or something like that. Some New Yorker created it. There's also like vocal booths that you can use where you can put your head in. It can be a little, for me, that would have been too claustrophobic. I couldn't have, I would rather move than, do, than sing into something like that. But um there are other options or maybe soundproofing the room that you're in and it might mean just putting up some curtains or blankets on the walls. You know, you don't necessarily have to go the whole professional soundproofing route, but um, th there might be some things that you could be doing to reduce the the sound carrying or singing in a different area of the the house if that's possible or your flat so it's disturbing less people. I think it is difficult, you know, as I'm here in in, uh, in New York in an apartment uh, and I'm hearing all sorts of noise from upstairs, downstairs and across the way. It can be difficult, yeah. The other option is could you potentially go uh, to a practice room? So quite a lot of piano shops will have practice rooms where you can go and make as much noise as you need to or want to. That's what I used to advise people in London, um, you know, maybe share one with somebody. And then my, I used to sometimes rent my studio out for people to practice. Yeah, so 
there might be somewhere that you could do that, maybe a local church or, or a dance school. Yeah. And another one for those who have students living in halls or in, in flats together, I say get together and do a practice night together. You know, you're keeping each other accountable. You've got that external feedback with your peers. You're getting used to singing with people who you're going to have to sing with in ensemble classes anyway. So do it from the beginning and you'll, you know, by third year it will be normal. You'll right. feel normal. But when I was at school, I remember when the teacher said, you know, those famous words, right, homework planners at the ready, you could just hear this groan reverberate around the room because we were about to be set to this task, but mm. apart from me, because I quite enjoyed homework because I was a bit of a loser. <laughs> but people like Eddie Cortez, who we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I mean, that word has connotations of unhappiness and work and cutting out your freedom. And I just wonder whether the word practice kind of falls into that whole as well. So how can we use our language? How can we set up our practice routines without it making it look like it's homework? Well, the thing is, and this is my thoughts on language, you might find a whole other word. And after a while, that will just have the same connotations because it's not the word really, it's the the actual actions. And I think this goes back to creating autonomy, you know, so you might say to the student, I would like you to be regularly doing this work in between in, in order for you to progress. What do you want to call it? <laughs> um, so get them on board with it so that they've made the decision about whether they call it homework or practice or having fun or progressing or whatever it is that they want to utilize. Um but I think it's more about the belief behind what that means rather than the actual word. And and so that goes back to the goal setting and the motivation, you know, finding the motivation for that student and how they learn as well. I think quite often the reason why homework or practice has this negative connotation, I remember this myself from when I was learning clarinet, is because... Um, Nobody really explained to me why I was doing all these scales and they didn't give me uh, variations, you know, or applications so that I could immediately see how, oh, if I run this scale, then that's going to help me do this passage in this song. And I wonder too if maybe the teacher can help join those dots a little bit more so that the student can understand the purpose and that will incentivize them to go and do that work. I and mean, it's not easy, you know, progressing. It's, it's, it's just not easy. It can be tough and it can, that's the other thing too, is that at times people will plateau and they'll think that they're not progressing, but actually plateauing is an important part of development. So helping the student understand that, yeah, there are times when we're going to plateau and it might be, you might be sitting in this place for the next couple of weeks or even a month or two, but actually you need to be there for that length of time in order to get to the next stage. So it's all normal and maybe there's some other things we can do in and around it that will keep you motivated and uh, get you through this more potentially boring time. So setting up practice then, can you give us like a re rehearsed thing we could say or do each time at the end of a session to send away practice with a student for that week? I think this goes back again to this idea of agreement versus expectation. And I will often say, what worked for you today? And is there something you would like to particularly work on? Or maybe in the beginning of the lesson, they've come in with a specific thing that they want to work on. And I'll say, okay, so has that these exercises been helpful for you to achieve, you know, what you want um, in terms of your voice? And if it has, then I would recommend that you focus on these exercises this week uh, in order to really instill that into your body and your mind. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'd always try to get an agreement going with my students because I feel like there's more likelihood of 
them going and doing what needs to be done. And then also, because, and I'm like this myself, as soon as someone tells me I have to do something, I'm like, I'm not going to do that, even though (laughs) it might be what I want in terms of, you know, to progress. But suddenly I'm like, I'm not going to do what that person tells me. And I do it even to myself. I'm not going to do what you tell me, even though it's me. So if I've got a student who's a little bit like that, then it's really important to get them on board, you know, agreeing what it is that they're going to do. So the other thing is to not overload them with too many different things to focus on. And, you know, if you guide them through what are the objectives, you know, what are the criteria, um, I I like to use a scoring method of one to five where one is like we haven't really achieved it, five is it's achieved, and three is obviously somewhere in the middle. Um, so then they can use that in their own practice as well when they're practicing or, you know, going through the scales, they look at the different criteria that they've decided that they or we've agreed that they want to achieve and then they can score themselves one to five and it's, not a judgy score it's like you know it's not about five means you're really good it means five I've actually achieved these objectives and if I haven't achieved these objectives you know if I've given myself a four what do I need to do in order to get that five and think about it more objectively and functionally rather than emotionally Mm -hmm. so if after all of this the student just comes back and to be fair to them they're being honest they're saying I am not practicing, I just haven't practiced. How do we manage our own frustration as a teacher when we're kind of putting this effort in to this person and it just doesn't seem to be reciprocated in their development, their self-development? I think it becomes a conversation of, well, what are your overall objectives? You know, where do you want to be in six months, a year, two years? And if they've got these goals you know that you know and they probably know themselves require them to do some work then it becomes the discussion around well what's causing that resistance you know why when when you go to do that work or think about that work what are the thoughts that are coming up uh what are the beliefs that are driving those thoughts and that might take you know a whole session i've been in that situation where i've actually sat down with somebody and gone, we're not going to do any singing today because you're not progressing and doing the work in spite of the fact that you've said that you wanted to achieve X, Y, and Z. So let's get to the bottom of what's going on here. And then I'll, you know, ask some questions about is it, you know, a time thing? Is it a environmental thing? Is it a mindset thing? And then depending on what the answers are, Either I'll come up with some suggestions um, around the environment and the time thing, or if it's a mindset thing, and it's actually what drove me down the pathway of doing hypnotherapy in the end, um, then, you know, I'll say, okay, well, you need to deal with those mindset issues because they're going to hinder you all the way and you will never achieve your goal because, unfortunately, in order to achieve it, you're going to have to do this regular work. So I think it becomes a conversation. now. That's a lot easier, obviously, with older people and children, maybe less so with kids. And so then that's about adjusting your expectations. And, I mean, you could make an agreement with a child. There's no reason why you can't. And certainly when it comes to classroom management, you know, with younger children, it's an agreement that you make between the teacher and the children as to, you know, what the rules are. And um, you could do the same with your younger children as well and and of course then the parents need to be involved in that as well um the other thing that was quite (laughs) uh freeing for me was recognizing that if i did all these things and the students still didn't do the work that they needed in order to progress then i wasn't at fault and that I didn't need to take on that responsibility. And I would say to the student, I, all I can do is open the door for you. The rest of that work, you know, stepping through has to come from you. And and it, it released me also uh, from not feeling that I was responsible for them not progressing. 
And the other thing actually just just that just reminded me is that actually I realized that even by coming once a week to the singing lesson, many students still did progress. And I and I realized that with some of my students, that was their practice session, was having the lesson. And I, my if I adjusted my expectations of how their voice progressed, then it became a lot more enjoyable for me as well. Lastly, as voice teachers, we're often the ones preaching to students, you know, work on your voice, work on the voice. The very thing that we don't find time to do ourselves because we're so busy working with other voices. So how important is it for us to practice as teachers? And again, how do we fit that in? Is it just the same as how we're advising our students to? Yeah. And look, there's always going to be someone who cancels or comes a little late or you could stay behind a little later or start a little earlier to incorporate your own practice. And that's what I used to do when I was working much more around technique because I felt it was important for me to be able to do what I'm asking my students to do. And the only way I did that is if I kept my voice fit and fit for purpose. And, and I also had regular lessons as well that incentivized me so that you know, if I was paying for a lesson, I wanted to make sure I was progressing and um, going, getting further down the track with each lesson. And I couldn't do that if I didn't do the practice. So I knew that having a lessons incentivized me, you know, so that when I, it was kind of like an accountability thing. Um, and then also the other thing that incentivized me was the wanting to be able to show that I could do it um, with my students, uh, not that I was just talking about it in theory. So that was me figuring out what incentivized me. And then the other thing is that could you dress up the practice in something else? Oh, so, and actually, in addition to that, is quite often I would do the exercise with the student that I felt like I needed to do. So then I got a little bit of work in. So, you know, when you, you know, if you have six, seven, eight students a day, that ends up being quite a lot of minutes of your own practice. So you can dress up the scales in around a melody. So instead of just a regular scale, you know, like an octave arpeggio or long scale, you actually choose a segment of melody and then you progress those, you know, do all the key changes back and up and down. And the person is still doing the whatever the sound exercises that you've set them, but they're doing it to a melody and it doesn't feel so much like just doing scales, you know, which I think a lot of people... Um, get put off by because they don't I mean I like some scales <laughs> that's me uh, I just like them uh, but some people see that you know negatively so could you be doing it that way or could you be doing some rhythm work around it as well uh, or phrasing work you know so there's a whole bunch of things you can do to change the way that the uh, exercises are um, used um, by changing the scale patterns or, you know, incorporating something that's more melodic. Because there are tunes out there that are move in smaller intervals, you know, like semitones and tones, and there's tunes that move in more arpeggiated uh, distances and some that are quite wide over the range and some that are quite short. So it might take a little bit of research to find that. Uh, and in and in, you know you might find actually instead of playing these things you just create nice little accompaniment which is the chord changes. You know, so there's lots of ways of dressing things up, in and they're still doing exercises, uh, but it just doesn't. It feels more fun maybe. Mm, yeah. Well, Lynn, thank you so much for the chat. It just reminded me that I probably should go and do my practice now. But it's been great to chat with you over the pond, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Yes. Well, thank you. And uh, happy practicing, everybody. <laughs>